Um, we first started at Pacific Islanders in communications, making people pitch. They were like, what is this? And not only was there a, um, you know, that hill of public speaking to climb over, but it's also a cultural thing of, I don't want to like toot my own horn or I don't want to say how awesome my project is. And we all just got to get over that because everyone else is doing it. So. We'll bring up Dean and Joe, and they'll explain to you why it's so important and um, give you some tips about it. Thank you. Thanks, Leanne. Hi, everybody. I'm Dean Hamer. This is Joe Wilson. Good morning, everybody. Aloha. Let me see if I can. Probably, like most of you, I'm at once inspired by Juki's presentation and incredibly nervous. <laughs> Because I'm one of those people who many of you may be able to relate to hold a lot of fear about standing in front of an audience full of people and trying to remember how to articulate what I'm about to articulate. Uh, but we're really happy to be here and we really, really appreciate the work that Pacific Islanders in Communications, a level of community media, et cetera, do to help all of us figure out how we can tell important stories and amplify them among the communities that are really important to us. Um, as Dean gets uh, the okay. slideshow up, here we are. So just so you know a little bit about who we are and how we came to this. So Dean and I lived for many years, decades actually, in Washington, D.C., where I was working in the human rights field. Dean, a scientist, researcher at the National Institutes of Health. But at one point in our lives together, something really important happened, um, and it became a story that we thought needed to be addressed, told, and a story that maybe could help illuminate issues that were really important to us in important ways and help promote action <coughs> towards change. So that sent us in the direction of using media, in this case, documentary film, to tell those stories to try to reach the audiences that we wanted to try to reach and motivate to create change. So that first film we made was called Out in the Silence. It was broadcast on PBS. Uh, it eventually became a film that we did a large campaign with um, to help promote social change. It brought us out here to Hawaii, where we made a film called Kumuhina, another film called A Place in the Middle, Ladies Awaiting, Lady Eva. All documentaries uh, that have been broadcast on PBS, supported by Pacific Islanders of Communications that we use to help educate, raise awareness, and promote ways that people can become involved in promoting social change in one form or another. As we talk about how you pitch your ideas, the stories you want to tell and garner support for how you want to tell those stories, and more importantly, how you want to use those stories to go out and promote change, we were lucky enough when we made our first film to be invited to be participate in what was just being launched, this new program called The Good Pitch. It was created by a couple of different institutions, the Ford Foundation in New York, the Sundance Institute, which most of us know as a, a great kind of filmmaking institution, and an organization in London called the Doc Society, now it's based in London and New York, who all came together with this idea to say, many people are using film in media to tell important stories. It's one thing to have those stories be told, broadcast, perhaps uh, screened in cinemas, et cetera, so what more needs to be done, what more can be done with those stories to get them out to communities so people who relate to these things or need to know about these things can use them to promote really important social action. So with that film, we became acquainted with this amazing idea called Good Pitch. We ourselves were lucky enough to garner several hundred thousand dollars to do a social impact campaign with a film that we had made to go out and promote and advocate for the issues that the film represented engage communities all across the U.S., et cetera, in this action for change. So we're now really excited, becoming big believers in this concept of how we use important spaces to bring people in our communities together, to foster collaboration and generate new forms of support for this kind of work, to be bringing good pitch here to Hawaii. 
Some of you, is there anybody in this room that has heard of it so far, that we're doing Good Pitch Local Hawaii in November? Great. We're lucky enough to have some of our pitch teams who have been selected to pitch on November 6th in the room with us today. And a little later, we're actually going to do what's really important, and I think what Jicky talked about, which is getting up and practicing, getting comfortable with speaking in front of an audience, feeling what the audience's reactions are like, how you incorporate that into what you're doing, and even you know, in this room today, um, getting feedback from each other, getting suggestions, questions, just to become more familiar with this concept. So um, I'm now going to turn it over to Dean, who is going to talk about what are the essential elements that we think, from our perspective, as having gone down this route of media for social change, um, what are some ways you can be impactful pitchers? So just like there are many, many different types of films that you can make, almost an infinite amount, um, so there are many different types of pitches you can give. And there's no one formula fits all. But there are certain elements that I think are common of all good pitches, and that's what we're going to focus on. I'll be talking mostly about the type of pitches we do for our work, social issue documentaries, but I'll try to give you examples of how they could be used for um, short fiction films or podcasts or any different type of media that you might be interested in. And the big elements that are common in all pitches is, first of all, What's your issue? What's the big social issue or the big problem or the big thing that you're talking about? Not the little thing, but the big thing. What's the big picture that you're interested in? The second key element is story. And this is really the key element of any piece of media. What happened and who did it happen to? And how can you tell that in a compelling way? Your story is what you're going to use to bring your issue alive to the audience. The third element is the how. You know, this is the nuts and bolts of things. Are you making a TV show? How long is it? Are you making a film? Are you making a podcast? Are you making a newspaper article? And what's going to be in it? Is it going to be a bunch of interviews? Or is it going to be animation? Or what are the nuts and bolts of how you're going to bring your story to life on a screen? Then there's the question of goals. So for social issue types of films, this is, of course, really important. Because the reason you're pitching is to have your piece of media do something. And the person that you're pitching to, they don't want to just know that it's a great story. They, they want to know what's going to happen. Or in other words, what am I getting from my money or my help or whatever I'm going to contribute to you? And then last of all, when you're pitching, it's really important to say, what you need exactly. Because it's easy for people to just nod their head and say, that's a great idea, yeah, that's really an important issue. It's something else to say, and I can help you buy. You need to tell people how they can help you. And you need to be kind of specific about, uh, about your needs. And of course, to tailor your pitch to the people you're pitching to, to make sure you're asking them for things that they have, okay? So those are the big elements. Let's go through them and start uh, talking in a little bit more detail. So, What's the issue? This is a pretty easy concept. What's the, the big problem that you're talking about? So perhaps you're making a film uh, about homelessness. You might have a story about one person, but the big issue is homelessness for everybody. Uh, why is that issue important? And in particular, why is it important to the people that you are pitching to? Well, a big part of that is who does it affect? And one point I really want to make is that a lot of social issues and social issues films are about some marginalized group, some bunch of people whose voices aren't heard or who are discriminated against. And of course, we always think, oh, it's to help them. But I think it's really important to broaden your mind and to realize that the problem that one minority group may have actually affects everybody in society. So like, for example, one of the films that we worked on was called A Place in the Middle. And it's a story about a young girl, 11 years old, who is in a Hawaiian uh, charter school. And she sees the boys doing a really cool hula number. And she says, I want to join the group. And of course, all the boys are like, no, 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 no. This is only for, only for boys. But her teacher is Kumuhina, who is Mahu. And she says, no, just wait a second. In Hawaii, we have a place for everybody. We have a place in the middle for girls like you. And so she joins the hula group. 
And then, of course, inevitably, she becomes the best chanter in the group, and then she leads the entire group, and not to give away the film, but at the end, they have a magnificent performance at the school, and it's just absolutely amazing and everything. So when we were talking about that film and pitching it, it wasn't just that this film is going to help kids like Ho'onani, who, you know, was able to find her place. It helped everybody in the school. And the idea of diversity is that it's important for everybody. So that really broadens the appeal, because after all, most people uh, and the people who cause the problems are on that side and not on the other side. So think about the, who is affected by your problem in the widest possible terms. And I'll just mention here, and I'll mention it again, this might be the right time to introduce why you are the person who should be making this film, especially if you happen to be a member of that particular group or if this issue affects you. So if you are a person who has been left without a house or you are a person who is in the middle or you're a person who's teaching a person who's in the middle, uh, this might be the time for you to explain why you're making this particular film. The next element is story, and this, of course, is probably the most important element. This is why we make media. It's to tell <coughs> stories. And I want to be real clear. A story is a narrative, and it's a linear narrative. A, then B, then C. It's not always told in a linear fashion. Flashbacks and the like are very common. But it essentially outlines a series of events and people that happen. That's the essential elements of a story. The other essential elements of story are characters. Every once in a while, you'll have someone say, I'm going to make a film, and the ocean is going to be the main character, or the city will be the main character. And in principle, that's possible, but it usually works a lot better if there's a person involved, because we can all relate to people in a way that we can't to abstract objects. Usually, one of the characters is a hero, or at least in the center of the film. And that's going to be the most important element of your film. You can also have villains. Villains are really good. And if you're making a story, I highly advise that you try to get the villains as well as the heroes, because it makes them look much better if you do it that way. Um, let me just say a word about story structure. So just like there's an infinite number of stories, there's also an infinite number of structures. But there is one structure that you're going to see a lot, and that is very common in Western storytelling, at least, and also in most of the media that we're familiar with. And that's the so-called three-act structure. And the three acts are act one, you meet the main character, and you find out what hurdle they're trying to overcome. What, what is their quest? What are they trying to do in life? In act two, Complications arise, difficulties occur, other characters are introduced. There are almost triumphs and then there are almost failures. And usually at the end of Act Two, there's a great climatic clash of some sort, a battle or a revelation. And in Act Three, everything gets resolved. Uh, sometimes things get worse before they get better, but eventually something happens. Uh, something good, if it's a romance or a comedy, or something bad if it's a tragedy. So this three-act structure is very familiar to people and will make them feel like they can relate to their story. But I have to say that if you are making a pitch, you don't always want to reveal the third act. First of all, you may not know what the resolution is going to be, if you're, especially if you're at the beginning of your filmmaking. And second of all, because even if you know what it is, you might want to leave it as a sort of a cliffhanger or a tease. Just like in a trailer for a film, you don't want to show the very ending of the film. You want people wanting to know, I want to know more, I want to more, know more, I want to be part of this project as that's revealed. Then there's the nuts and bolts of how. And of course, platform is very important because we're here at Olelo. Probably most of you are going to be interested in making a TV show, which is great. Uh, we make TV documentaries. That's one form that's, that's very popular and covers a lot of different grounds. Um, short films are another great way of getting messages across and also a great way to learn how to make a feature if you want to be a Spielberg type of person. 
Uh, but there's lots of other formats that we have now. You can do things completely on the web. And web series are really popular now. It's a big hot area. Uh, audio, podcast. You know, social media has brought in this whole idea of Facebook Live. I think there's probably more media on Facebook Live now than there is almost anywhere else. So there's lots of opportunities there. Uh, and of course, don't forget, there's these things called newspapers, which are actually like big websites, but they're <laughs> put, they put on paper usually. And those can be really useful too, especially here in Hawaii where we have the Civil Beat, for example, that covers all types of areas. And then style is just a matter of, well, what type of material are you putting in there? Are they going to be interviews? Is it going to be live action footage, animation, archival materials, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And you want to at least mention these during your pitch because that will give a feeling for how the story is going to come to life. Don't forget to talk about your goals. And I really want to emphasize that people tend to say the same goals for every project. But the reality is that different areas and different films and different projects should have rather different goals. So for example, raising awareness is something that you hear all the time. I would say this is something to emphasize if your particular problem is one that is not well understood by the general public. So for example, one of the projects that we have coming to Good Pitch Local Hawaii is about sex trafficking in Hawaii. And I think it's fair to say that a lot of people didn't realize, wow, this is, a, Hawaii is actually a hub for this problem. And it really is a big issue. And it's not just something that happens in other places. It's something that happens right here, right under our noses, right in nightclubs or on streets that we may be familiar with. Raising awareness to the general public is something really important for that type of film. On the other hand, for someone working on homelessness, of course, raising Awareness, educated awareness is important, but everybody knows about homelessness. There are other issues or other goals that are probably more important. Um, education is very important, but when you say education, don't talk about this as a goal unless you have a realistic plan for actually bringing your film into educational backgrounds. Not every film is going to go into schools. In fact, there are very peculiar and specific requirements for the types of media that actually get into schools. Um, with a place in the middle, uh, we actually made that film and cut it down from an hour and a half documentary to 20 minutes specifically so that it would be aimed for schools. And we changed the narrator in the film from Kumuhina to a young kid so that it would be told from a kid's view. And that made it very appropriate for schools. Uh, it's been a very popular online learning tool. Um, but it actually required really quite a lot of of extra work, I would say, to make it available for educators. Um, you have goals like inspiring behavioral change. You know, this is not useful for some projects, but for one of the projects we have coming to Good Pitch Local Hawaii, it's about um, oxobenzenes in sun cream and how that just is destroying the reef. And their behavioral change is very important, and the campaign is don't buy sunscreen with oxybenzone in it. And that was actually uh, quite uh, effective. Um, and I know that we don't use that. Now we have the zinc stuff. It makes your face look all white, but that's cool. It's, it's good. Um, changing public policy. Uh, this is something which is very important in many different areas. Actually, again, for the Reef Project, they were able to pass a law in Hawaii so that now you can't buy sunscreen with oxybenzone, which is awesome. And of course, for issues like um, immigration, uh, law is incredibly important for many, many different subjects. Uh, Lastly, I just want to talk about empowering and creating new coalitions. You know, one thing that's really good about movies is that they're fun to watch. At least some movies are fun to watch. And so they can be used as a sort of entertainment or a way to bring people together who wouldn't necessarily get together otherwise. With our first movie, Out in the Silence, which was actually about the fact that he and I got married together and then he announced it in his local home newspaper in a small town and it caused a big stir. The biggest thing that we did was to go around to little towns throughout Pennsylvania and throughout the country and hold screenings of this gay film in places that had never had any sort of openly gay event before. 
And in that way, we were able to get people to come together that wouldn't normally come together. We found people in progressive roots, even in rural areas, that weren't necessarily concerned about LGBT issues, but became so. And to get together different progressive groups that normally wouldn't have really interacted with one another, with church groups, for example. And that's a really important goal for many different types of social issues. Last but not least, don't forget to mention uh, what the person opposite from you can do for you. You've been telling them about this great need. You had this great story to illustrate it. This is how you're going to do it. But what do you need from them? So often you'll think, well, I need a camera person and I need an editor. That's great, especially if you're able to offer the same services back to them. Um, but another important area is making a film, making a TV show requires a lot of other expertise that's not necessarily in the so-called media area. And sometimes you can sell people about how sexy it is to be involved with media and how sexy it is to have a TV show and stuff that can help you out. Like, for example, lawyers. You, you always need a lawyer. Consents, releases, intellectual property, all that stuff. Uh, if you have a cast, a caterer, somebody to provide, you know, yummy food would be absolutely awesome. Um, you're always looking for partners, not necessarily partners to give you money, but partners that can work together in the same area. Very important. And again, mutuality is really important. For out in the silence, our best partner was the ACLU. ACLU is kind of organized in every state and had a lot of partners, so they were able to spread the rumor to their partners. But we had screenings that would attract people in you know, nice theaters, and people would come. And the ACLU was always there signing up new members to ACLU. So it's a very mutually beneficial uh, type of operation. Of course, you're always looking for amplifiers. These are the people that are actually going to broadcast your materials. Uh, if you're doing projects here in Alelo, you're really lucky because you have a TV station that's ready to go. And that's really amazing. Um, we're actually really lucky in Hawaii to have such an extensive community media operation. That's not true in most states, and uh, it's really pretty amazing here. Uh, and then lastly, of course, you're always looking for supporters. And I usually suggest that you sort of mention this last, because everybody knows that you need money, because everybody needs money. Um, it's useful, I think, to be specific. I need $40,000 in order to do the final color correction and sound fix for this, and then we'll have the finished film. That's much better than saying, I need $40,000 because, you know, uh, my credit card is like in the, in the red, which may be true, but it's more important to have the money allocated somehow. Okay, any questions, comments? Suggestions. I'm trying to make eye contact with everybody. <laughs> suggested. Maybe it would be interesting to know too what um, people in the room are doing. Like, who here has a project that they're currently working on or excited about thinking about how they're going to pitch it? Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the things you're working on? Uh, working on a SAG signatory web series, 20 episodes. About? It's like action. Romance comedy. Oh. Yeah. It's going to be more like um, bloody kind. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. the, the story is like a karaoke singer by, um, as work, but he's a vigilante because something like something had happened to him. So I'm the lead in him, and I'm the writer, director, producer, everything. Okay. But I have a cast of over 20 people already. Okay, cool. Okay. So, something uh, not social issue documentary. Something so actually potential. fun to watch. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm at the very beginnings of wanting to produce an idea um, kind of based on a true life scenario. Um, at the very beginnings of it, but um, regarding senior abuse or elder abuse. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Social issue, yes. important. Yes. Got to think I about think how to present that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh. 
Yeah. I thought you were looking for yeah. more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm doing animal documentaries, ocean okay. animals, and um, not only how we can help to uh, create sustainability and preserve them, but also how we can connect with them and how humans and the animals need each other um, and how it just makes for a better world. A better world. Yes. Okay, great. I'm going to personify good. the animals and everybody's going to love them. <laughs> Another good social issue yeah, and animals yeah. are adorable. Yes. yes. <laughs> Sorry, keep Always social. <laughs> yeah. There's one more in the back. It's yeah. yeah. I'm going to stand up so you can see me. Yeah. Um, we, I'm trying to do something that um, I would say is not possible. Um, in the town of Kailua, which used to be rural and now has turned into a Waikiki, based on the development of one of the big five companies in Hawaii, um, has taken over Kailua and made it into a moneymaker. And so the nice, pristine, Bonnie High, Kailua beaches, et cetera, is going downhill. All the old establishments of Kailua is no more. It's the old Liberty House has turned into a really, anyway, I won't get into all of that. There's one establishment left besides Time Supermarket, you know, that kind of thing. It's called Pully Lanes. It's a bowling alley. All the bowling alleys are getting yeah. wiped out. There's about three. So what, it, what am I trying to do? Not me, but <laughs> I've joined a group who's trying to preserve keeping Kailua Kailua or keeping country country. Hmm. And the Big Five is really, obviously, they have the deep pockets. They have everything that with the snap of the finger, they control the lease. And they're really smart in how they're proceeding. The group is smart, too, so they approach Hawaii Heritage from, uh, and, and registered. Great. So that's a question of how you're going to turn what's obviously an important cause into media and almost thinking of media as your PR or whatever, which is also really important. Okay, so we have uh, a variety of different types of projects. Let's take a look at um, a pitch that ended up being successful and critique it based on what I just said. And then we're going to start thinking about how you would pitch the different variety of projects mm -hmm. that, that we've had here already and use some of these topics in order to bring into that. And this is a pitch that is based on the model that we're in, you know, implementing here in Hawaii, the good pitch local model. Um, where So any, any time you have an opportunity to pitch, it's going to have its own constraints based on the forum you're in. This one is based on the idea that you should be able to convey your idea in three to four minutes uh, with the opportunity to engage with the audience with moderators who are really going to help after the pitch is made, after you say, this is my story, this is what I need, the moderators are then going to step up and embrace you and help engage the audience in a conversation. So you don't have to convey everything in the pitch just the most important things, to stimulate the audience to get involved afterwards. So this is one example we wanted to share. Happened in Texas. Hi, everyone. Welcome there. So I'm Chelsea Hernandez, and I'm here with my project, Building the American Dream. It's a film that uncovers the harsh reality and human cost of the lucrative Texas construction industry through the eyes of immigrant workers. And so I'm here seeking partners for a VR storytelling project that will complement this feature film. So I kind of want to put this in context first. How many people are from Dallas or live in Dallas? Okay. Um, how many people have worked in construction or know a family member who's in construction? And how many have passed a construction site? Maybe on the way here, every day? Yeah, that's pretty much everyone. Well, 30 minutes from here, a 25-year-old uh, undocumented worker died from heat stroke on the job. Um, he was not allowed to get a simple sip of water because here in Texas, there is no state law that mandates uh, businesses to give their workers a paid rest break. And now we'll um, watch a clip from the film. Texas has been trying to lure companies away from other states with the promise of lower taxes and lighter regulation, something people are calling the Texas miracle. 
we're the second largest economy in the country, but there's an ugly side of the Texas miracle that a lot of people don't talk about. Half of the workforce is undocumented in the construction industry. That the people who are building the state's economy are literally dying. We begin with that accident at a construction site that left one person dead. No te lo lleves, por favor. Devuélveme a mi hijo, no te lo lleves. Those undocumented workers are fighting real battles because without the protection of citizenship, they are vulnerable to exploitation. On 2004, that's when he passed away. Completamente su cráneo se quebró. Costillas se le quebraron. Una de ellas perforó el corazón. O sea que no, no hubiera tenido ninguna posibilidad. The Texas construction industry employs a million workers, and nearly half of those workers are undocumented. Let that soak in a little bit. Nearly half of the million person workforce are undocumented. So that means that the $72 billion industry profits from these hazardous working conditions, and it puts immigrant workers at lives, and also like all the workers, the entire industry. So using the technology of VR storytelling, um, audiences can really see through the eyes of immigrant workers who face these dangerous conditions on a daily basis, um, like heights, extreme weather, um, lack of safety equipment. So what I intend to do is incorporate these VR stories into a multi-year impact and engagement campaign that will combine grassroots screenings and events with online tools and opportunities to engage online. And we believe that it has the potential to do a few things. Um, a couple of those. <laughs> Wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> A couple of those will to help workers understand their rights and um, how to report unsafe working conditions. We also, along with like shedding light on the dangerous conditions, we want to reshape the narrative surrounding immigration reform. And we think we can do that through a traveling VR exhibit and go to um, communities, uh, community festivals and events um, like the rodeo that is happening. Um, so, do you, do you have a final thought? <laughs> Um, so I really want to put people like in the shoes of construction workers, and I think this VR project can do that. I also want to say that we've had the support so far from the Ford Foundation and Austin Film Society, and so we're seeking VR professionals to help us with this project, um, partners that can host these screenings, organizations that can help uh, use these stories to train um, their member groups as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Give a round of applause. <laughs> So that, I, I just like that. She's a perfect, you know, example of, she's not the most well-polished presenter, but she's really relatable, I think. And so she does a really good job of making it, like, really personal, why it's important that she's telling the story. She uses a great kind of media clip, you know, to bring people right into that space with her. And she does a really good job at making everybody in the room feel like they can kind of relate to the issue, and obviously she makes some really important asks at the end. So this is an example of some of the things, the way the room kind of came alive after she did her presentation. Um, people offer her you know, opportunities for funding, um, POV, which is one of the most important PBS, national PBS um, documentary platforms, um, offered her you know, the opportunity to engage, and I think it will be scheduled for broadcast. Um, Kickstarter stepped up and said, we'd love to help you fundraise for your um, outreach campaign after this. A local organizing group wanted to get involved because they could see immediately how that piece of media would help their organizing work, which is a really important component of those of us who are media makers and those of us who are organizers figuring out how we're going to use media to amplify our work. So then um, she went on with the support she garnered at that really small pitch to then you know, appeal to larger institutions that really helped lift her project off the ground. You might recognize some of these names. Um, and her film ultimately became a feature film that just premiered this past April at the South by Southwest Film Festival. So she's off and running now. She made her piece, but now she's committed to doing the outreach that she talked about. How is she going to affect change for the people whose lives she and many other people are really concerned about. So it's an exciting example of how to just do a small but compelling pitch and really have a big impact. But, as you might have noticed, 
She ran on a little bit too long. <laughs> and if I have one advice for you for making a pitch, make it shorter. And then make it a little bit shorter after that. It's just a really important piece of advice. So what I'm going to suggest is this afternoon we're going to listen to some people who have already been working on pitches and are now at sort of at the perfecting stage for this good pitch event. And we're going to hear from them. But for each of you that has your own project, if you would like, we'll give you an opportunity to come up and pitch it without media, but you need to do it in one minute. One of the most important things you can do when you're writing grants, when you're pitching, when you're thinking about your own project, is the exercise of describe your project in one sentence. It may be a really long sentence and may have a couple of semicolons in it. You might actually make it two or three short sentences, that's fine. But how to describe your project in a short way. And this is actually something practical. Has anyone ever heard of something called the elevator pitch? Yeah, it's exactly what it sounds like. You step into an elevator, there's the guy with the money. What do you say to them to engage them and get them interested in that one minute? And that's one of the most important things you can do. And you're going to go back to, and you're going to use that elevator pitch for the entire one or two or three or four or five or however many years you're involved with that project. It'll be useful every single time. Um, I think we can, should we wrap up or um, just a few other, yeah. I just wanted to offer this comment. I used to uh, uh, run a, uh, an event every year at Chaminade University where we told faculty, you can only speak for four minutes. Yeah. Of course, nobody rehearses that. Nobody, everyone thinks I'm only sp speaking for two minutes and it's like eight. Yeah. Uh, and so then we said, no, it, it's now a page limit. Because I sat there and I said, one page double spaced is about two and a half minutes. So I gave people a page limit. I was just last week at a, uh, an event. It was a fundraiser for the Philcom Center. And they had some speakers. And they actually gave people a word limit. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they, they said, we're not going to talk about you know, how many minutes you can speak, you, ha you, can, you have to do it in this many words. And that was how they did it. Because mm -hmm. they knew nobody um, uh, thinks about, they don't rehearse the number of minutes they take. Right. They actually gave them a word on it. Mm -hmm. right. It's very mm -hmm. interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's all good advice. Um, just don't forget to mention why you're making the film. It might be that you're personally involved, but it also could be that you're a person who has unique access. Um, Joe and I have been making films in Hawaii, even though we're clearly not Hawaiian. Uh, but we've had really good access because we've become friends with Kumuhina and with all of her circle, and I think that's important. Um, don't be shy about mentioning your own expertise. If you've made a previous film or if you've had some success, um, talk about that. It's important to know who you are and why you're going to be competent enough to make something that's just imaginary uh, at this point. Um, and don't forget to think about who your audience is. Again, this is going to differ so much depending upon the project. If you're trying to raise awareness about an issue that most people don't know about, let's say sex trafficking in Hawaii, you're really looking to impress the general public. A medium like television, public television or Alelo, is absolutely great for doing that. Or you may be speaking to uh, press and media makers who will amplify your message, then tailor to it why this is going to be an important story for them, why it will be popular for their audiences. Or you may be speaking to the own niche groups, to the particular uh, disenfranchised groups that your films uh, are about. So I think that's, uh, that's about it for us. And our plan is we're going to have a little lunch, I believe, and then we're going to reconvene and we're going to learn about pitching in the best possible way, which is to hear some pitches. And you're all going to use your expertise to criticize, comment, suggest, and then think about your own pitches as well. OK. So hi, I'm Brittany Biggs. I'm an assistant professor of animation at the Academy for Creative Media at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm here to talk about my short animated film, Mano a Mano. So it illustrates the human impact on sharks and coral reefs as seen through the eyes of a tiger shark in Hawaiian waters over hundreds of millions of years. 
Uh, each time the shark submerges and surfaces above the water, great periods of time pass as revealed through the perspective of the shark. So from the creation of the Hawaiian Islands through the first Polynesian settlers, uh, ancient Hawaiians, the arrival of British explorers and missionaries, um, World War II's Pearl Harbor attack, the 60s and 70s surf and tourist in Waikiki construction explosion, and through modern day commercial fishing and shark finning. So through the time cuts, we also see the relationship between the shark and generations of a specific Hawaiian family who all bear the same familial tattoo on their hands. I'm working with the Nakachi family, who are cultural practitioners on the big island whose family, whose amakua is the shark, and who have been working for years to get legislation passed here in Hawaii to protect sharks. They've shared stories of how Hawaiians care for sharks, and vice versa, and they've also been providing feedback for my character designs, which I'm incorporating into the film. Um, prior to moving to Hawaii, I worked in the animation industry at DreamWorks Animation. I've also had my own personal animated films uh, awarded and screened internationally in film festivals. And the artwork you're seeing is some of the concept art that I've created for the film, and I'm currently on the cusp of animation production. So with your support, I know I can do this film justice. Um, so I don't know about you, uh, if you recognize the music at the beginning, um, but that movie, Jaws, certainly instilled a lot of fear, irrational fear as a child growing up which was also perpetuated by my brother, who would tell me that Jaws would come up out of the toilet to eat me. Um, but I'm not alone. These animals are feared and misunderstood. So my fear turned into fascination after getting scuba certified. And observing and swimming the sharks in their natural environments proved to me that they're not the man-eating machines that Hollywood portrays them as. So sharks have existed for more than 400 million years predating dinosaurs by more than 200 million years, and they've survived all five mass extinctions. Yet today, a quarter of the shark species are endangered because of us. So shark finning, shark calling, recreational, and commercial fishing and bycatch are all to blame. Shark finning is banned in the US, but it's still happening in our waters. In fact, even a year ago, here in Honolulu, a dozen men were arrested at the airport for trying to smuggle out nearly 1,000 fins mm. from Hawaii. So shark conservation is important not only from environmental and scientific reasons, I mean, removing an apex predator from the environment causes a cascading effect of problems that's gonna impact the entire world. Living and working in Hawaii, I understand and respect the cultural significance of sharks. Sharks are represented as sea gods, and for many Hawaiian people, sharks are their amakua, their family and their ancestors. Um, highlighting the cultural perspective alongside the environmental impacts makes this film unique because it showcases the connection people here in Hawaii have to sharks. It provides insights to those who are fearful, fearful of sharks and shows that these animals are revered and loved as family. So just like the movie Jaws inspired fear, I want this film to change the narrative to promote, promote respect and care for sharks. I want to raise awareness for the need to protect sharks both locally and globally. And we can start that by getting the bill SB 489 passed here in Hawaii to protect sharks. Um, this film is animated, which, raise, re, which reaches a wide audience, and I hope it will have impact on youth. So I'm also looking for partners for distribution, for festivals and screenings, and also for outreach with schools and museums. And in order to produce this film, I'm hoping I can work with someone to help me strategize a crowdfunding campaign, because this will allow me to actually have money to pay and hire local students and artists to help out with the film. So thank you for listening and for your support of my film, Mano a Mano. So let's not live hand to hand, but hand in hand, in harmony with sharks. Thank you. Excellent. <clears throat> Brittany, don't go away, please. That was <laughs> really wonderful. Well, first of all, you uh, clocked in at four minutes. So okay. you're in a really good place, I think, in terms of figuring out how you're going to pitch. So what are some reactions from the room to, to Brittany's pitch? I I'm curious about family from Big Island. What's yes. their last name? Uh, Nakachi. Oh, Japanese? did I not say their name? No, you said Oh, you did. Right. Okay. Right. Isn't that Japanese? Uh, Mike and Kaikea Nakachi. What's their Hawaiian, though? Uh, yeah. they, they have their, I mean, they've switch. said their lineage is from um, Amaku like the Amakua. Yeah, what, and what, which, what's their name? Their Hawaiian name? I'm, I'm, only, okay. I'm only knowing them as Mike and Kaikea Nakachi. I know they are definitely when I've also asked other um, people, who should I talk to about Amakua? They're like, you gotta talk to Kaikea. <coughs> and they're, they've been coming consistently to, to testify in support of the bill. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Cool. 
Any other reactions? Yeah. Um, well, are you looking for feedback on her presentation, or are we asking questions about her, or is it both? Well, let's say both, but whatever we think too would be most helpful oh, so okay. that Brittany's improving her ability to sure. communicate the ideas. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was very well um, put together. I felt like I got a real sense of your, your mission. Um, I wanted to know if you are planning to work with Ocean Ramsey or any of those uh, yes, so advocates. Yes, so I have actually, uh, last fall, I even joined one of their tours. Mm -hmm. So I got lots of reference footage. Swimming with the sharks, which is going to be very helpful when it comes time to animating. But yes, I, I certainly have um, joined them on different dives and learned a lot of information from them and would love their support too. <laughs> Go again, I'll you. Awesome. Um, sorry to monopolize your time. I no. just wanted to know the name of that bill again. That oh, it's SB 489. Okay. Thank you. SB. So is that bill going to be consistent next year or is it going to be a new bill? If I think it's consistent. So okay. at least my understanding is they it's definitely already been it almost got passed but at the last minute they took out sharks from the bill. So I know like for instance in the Nakachi family among others are going to be going back again next year to fight for the bill. To so be what I would do as a suggestion is I would put the legislation webpage where there's a webpage that you can put the bill number oh, in okay. to get status and that way if the bill has been closed or it's been renamed People can find that information. Mm. So you, if you do your presentation, you say, and if you want to look further, there's an app called the Kako app that you can put on your phone. If you want to check on the bill, or if you want to go to the legislation page, here's the link. Please contact the legislators awesome. in your area and find out and, and have them speak to me. I think your presentation is very powerful. I would like to see more of your face when you're looking down here. True, yes, I definitely I'm, know. And you're pulling out information that you already know. You, you know it by heart already, and, mm -hmm. but yet you're doing this. And so I lose that rapport with you when mm -hmm. you cut me off this way. I sure. need for you to look at me when you're, because if you're going to ask me for funds, mm -hmm. I need to know that you're talking to me. Mm -hmm. You're talking to everybody here. The other thing is, if you're going to talk about that family, if you get their permission, and you, you need to know, someone in the audience needs to know that they or a Hawaiian-based family, mm -hmm. if you get the permission, have their picture up on the <laughs> screen as well. If you're doing underwater media and you've done some scuba diving and you have that, you have footage, include a little bit of the footage. So every time that you speak, you orchestrate your media to coincide with that portion of your delivery. Because if you look at any I, Apple, mm -hmm. when they did their presentation, big screen, small person in the, the front talking, but the media is the message, mm -hmm. and it augments what they're delivering, and it makes it that much more powerful. Okay, thank mm. you. Mm. Yeah, mm. Uh, to tie that in, when you talked about ocean, we go to over what time? Eleven fifty or something. Really yep. You could tell it like connected you, and what he was saying, and you can tie some of that experience in, so people know you have hands-on connection. Okay. Like what these, what it meant to you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. What is the cap of your fundraising? So. Um, projected, just projected. Awesome. Gosh, I've been okay. worked on this somewhat recently. Uh, the next is Marie, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's the high, I don't high 40s. Um, yeah, <coughs> and, I mean, because a lot of the bulk of the work is me, so it's just especially getting help for creating the 3D assets that I'll be using in the film, so more of the production assets. And then lighting and compositing, and also just consulting to help me. Um, <coughs> but, and also, it's the sound design and composer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe, is there one question you're curious about, for example, like how the music is working or not? Or? Sure. I mean, a couple questions. I mean, just hearing all this feedback is incredibly helpful, so thank you all very much. Um, I guess my understanding is we only have three minutes, so that's a full minute I need to cut out. So. <laughs> Really? You're, you're doing good. The, the goal is to aim for three, okay. but you know, nobody's going to like, you know, hook you and drag you off the stage. You but, that you know, just remember, <laughs> seven, seven minutes. but just remember the longer you go, the less time we have to engage people sure. in offering their mono oh, from the audience or their okay. pledges. Let me ask the audience this. Um, did you find it distracting to have the music as she came up? Was it just kind of weird? Would it be better to have the music when she's talking about that specific slide? With the specific slide, and she talks about her brother. Or is it good to have it right at the beginning? Uh, for introduction, I like it was good attention getter. Yeah, 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. But I have a question. Yes. Is this based in Hawaii or in the world? This is. I mean, it's based in the perspective is Hawaii. So, so are you gonna use like legend or just <coughs> sharks in general, or even kind of like Hawaiian legend with sharks? Because um, there's a good shark and a bad shark. Right. Yeah. No, it's it's more so basically. It's it, like I said. Every time the shark was above and underwater, <coughs> you're getting a big time cut, and so you're also seeing. It's more just like some of the, the stories that the McClatchy family shared with me in terms of how they care for the shark. So feeding it, um, giving it offerings, and cleaning it. It's going to be those kinds of interactions over time. And then the film ends where the shark witnesses shark finning and then hmm. gets caught in a, a net hmm. and is struggling to get free and it's dying. Hmm. And then at the last moment, a Hawaiian free diver comes, cuts the net, and frees it. And as it swims away, she holds up the shaka. So it's mm. ending on a hope of, mm. on the note of hope. Okay, let's do one last question. Yeah. Are we going to see the family at different points uh, in their time, like maybe mm. as a kid, the girl, and then later, or? So <coughs> it's it's not the yeah, well, it's meant to be the same generation of the family, and so the way that we're seeing that visually is through uh, that they're going to all bear the same kind of tattoo, the uh, niho mano tattoo on their wrists and hands. So every time that there's that interaction with the shark, you know that, okay, this is a generational family and their lineage being tracked. Good. And One. I haven't, the, the Nikachi family, I did invite to the actual pitch, so I'm hoping they'll be in attendance, but oh, good. It, okay. it's a good idea to include okay. the photographs as okay. well. And what, one quick last one. I wondered how long it's going to be. I'm sorry? The piece. So shooting for approximately like six to seven minutes. That's it? Animation, takes animation, animation is tough. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Brittany. Okay, we're welcoming to the stage our next pitch presenter, Marie. Come on up. Take it away. Hello, everyone. My name is. Oh, should I go now? Oh, yes, I should. Hi, my name is Marie Ariel Hobro. I am the co creator, director, and producer of Greetings from Waikiki. Um, and the only way I can afford to live here is by sleeping in my family's living room with only a curtain to give me privacy. Um, because Hawaii has the highest cost of living in the nation, um, almost everyone I grew up with works multiple jobs, lives with 15 other family members, or has moved away in search of better living. Um, tourists now outnumber. Um, locals by six to one and na native Hawaiians by 30 to one. Seeing my home rapidly change because of our economy and gentrification, combined with being um, a documentary photographer and filmmaker, which is an incredibly sad field, sometimes makes me feel like a mini rain cloud is following me everywhere I go. But um, finding humor and sadness has always helped me in my life. Um, some people also think that I'm like a sociopath because I laugh at sad things, but it's okay. But um, we I probably shouldn't have said that, but um, we created this fictional, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. We created this fictional uh, mockumentary style show because we want to use comedy to create a larger discussion about these issues while bringing healing um, through laughter so we can all cry together. Um, so our show will follow Candy Connor Roberts, um, a primarily Hawaiian Filipino trans fake food artist as she struggles to save her family's hotel from land developers turning it into another expensive condo. My ties and the sweet aroma of the Alawai Canal. Um, the humor will be shown in the weird interactions that employees have with tourists, our comedic visuals, and most importantly, in our vibrant characters. Oops, sorry, let me turn the page. Um, if you grew up here, you'll feel like you know these people. Um, Candy, um, despite fighting for a place in her own home, she's also someone that has never felt Hawaiian, Filipino, or local enough. Um, her mom, Amelda, is a dramatic Filipino woman like my mom who wears bedazzled hats and likes to force you to eat all the time and her half brother junior boy is a local boy who revs his um, moped until 2 a.m. like my neighbors that I hate. <laughs> so um, even our potential shooting location is a character in itself rem reminiscent of an old Waikiki. Oh that's, that's Tati. Um, if we connect with a national streaming service, video on demand service, or TV network we can show the side of Hawaii that's normally overlooked. Um, in addition to raising funds to shoot our pilot episode in 2020, we would also um, we also need better access to equipment. And because the majority of us are documentary filmmakers, uh, we would also love to connect with a local um, narrative filmmaker mentor to help guide us through this process. Um, oh, we um, want the people of Hawaii to feel seen, no matter who they are. And we are a woman-led project made by um, local, diverse, experienced filmmakers who live and breathe these issues every day. 
sorry, let me flip my page again. Um, together we believe that we can change how Hawaii is viewed while evoking laughter and reflection at the same time. Thank you for mm. having me here. All right. Well, your presentation was amazing, and you came in at three minutes, so oh, you're okay. kind of right on target, which means I think as you think about presenting, you might you know, give yourself more time to kind of breathe and give space to yes. some of the it's things you're trying to say right so that people can absorb what you really want them to okay. absorb, but you're right on target. Um, reactions? Thoughts? You questions? Know you, you mentioned issues more in the back, <coughs> mm -hmm. but the issue is just um, the ratio of locals, right, versus tourists. I'm um, not really. It's just that plus, like, gentrification and the cost of living and um, everyone, like, living in, like, multiple, gen oh, like, multi-generational homes and working multiple jobs. So, is that, is that what you Yeah, mean? no, because yeah. when you threw in issues in the back, I was mm -hmm. like, well, wait, I thought the issues was something else. Oh, okay. Yeah, so maybe adjust that part. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Go ahead. Maybe just as, as a style comment. I don't know if maybe Jay can start, uh, speak to this. I know a lot of people, sometimes they'll apologize when they get nervous, or they'll tell people, oh, I'm sorry, I'm nervous, or... Um, I don't have any thoughts, just as a feedback. Right. Jackie, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apologizing to an audience really isn't necessary because what you're doing is you're, you're telling them your inconsistencies. You don't have any, really don't have any. And, and don't bring attention to it because then hmm. they might focus on, oh, well, she's nervous about something, and then you start rolling on that. The other thing, too, is, is when you start looking at everybody and you just look at their faces, pretend that you're talking to a family member. Mm -hmm. You're pitching to a family member. Mm -hmm. And the, off, the more times that you do this delivery, the less chance you're going to be using your notes. Okay. I like what you had notes there. I, I think when you have to flip it, mm -hmm. it's distracting. Okay. If you're going to use notes, then use cue cards that are easy for you just to okay. go that mm -hmm. way. And then just have bullets. You don't have to have a whole bunch of, of text on there, just something that will trigger the comment of what you're speaking on. It could just be one word. Mm -hmm. And then if you are using graphics, then make sure the graphics, like I said earlier with the earlier speaker, they're timed to a specific portion of where you're speaking to. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yes, don't, don't call attention to, okay. I'm mm -hmm. nervous, uh, don't apologize, <coughs> just, just do your delivery. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you. It's all about you making your point. Okay. Then building on what Jiggy said, I think when you're speaking regular, it's cool. I mean, you're funny, and I think humor really gets your point across really good. So if you're just yourself talking to people, I think it's powerful. Thank you. You live your own self. I usually hate myself, so I'll, but I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just felt that you, the way you came across was very approachable. Thank you. I really love the humor um, and just. I, I was impressed. Thank you. Hmm. I know I said this in our other pitch um, workshop, but <clears throat> your, the, what you're saying is so relatable. Like, I think all of us can relate in one way or another to that guy with that moped. <laughs> <laughs> I hate my neighbors. Uh, I'm so glad they moved. I hate them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think um, what will make this really pop is if you have a picture of the of the mom. Oh yeah. And you know, because then you can really relate to her. The, okay. the type of mom that's always e e e e e. Yeah. And if you got them a picture of the moped guy, okay. it doesn't have to be the actual moped guy. It could be what's his name. Uh, could it just be my neighbor? So I took a picture of him before. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> you can blur out his face. Like okay. Well, thanks yeah. for. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Great. So next, we're welcoming to the pitch stage, Kekama Amona. Hello, I'm Mike Otto. Um, oh, Scott William Kekama Aloha Anamakua Amona Kowino. No Kalaheo Ame Ualaka Amayao. Noho ao ma kaimuki. Uh, o ko o mea lani ka, um, ke kani. O ka hai pi ilani. Kalahine. Uh, my name is Scott. Uh, 
Okay, comma, also. I go by either or. But um, my father is Komeilani. My mother is uh, Kahai Pi'ilani. And they're very in influential to me regarding the stories that I tell. Hmm. Um, the name of my company is uh, Makavalu Films. If I have time, I'll explain that. But um, growing up here in Hawaii, um, first of all, how many people have lived here, born and raised here? Okay. How many have been here less than a year? Good. How many less than five years? How many less than 10? How many less than 20? 30? 40? Good. <laughs> now I know who you guys are. Um, but one thing I think we share in common is what we're seeing now and what I've lived through for how many years is the land struggles that we've seen, like Kaho Olave. Uh, you also seen um, Waihole Waikane. You see Sand Island. Uh, and again, Waimanalo. All these things keep happening over and over again. And we see it now on the Mauna. But we've seen Hawaiians being displaced off of their land, which is Hawaiian land. And it's always been very interesting to me about how when you watch these things from the past, what's been happening that I see is you see Native Hawaiian police officers and law enforcement officers, because it's not just police, being sent in to deal with and to arrest Hawaiian protesters, protectors. Now, for me, that's always been, it feels like the state will stick the knife in by saying you're not allowed to live on your own land. But then they twist it by having your own relatives come in and arrest you. And that's always been something to me that's just been, it's always gnawed at the back of my brain. So in 2015, uh, me and my wife started writing a short screenplay called E Malama Pono, Willy Boy. And E Malama Pono, Willy Boy is a short film, it's about 15 minutes. It's about a uh, Native Hawaiian police officer named William Willie Boy Kupehea, who's called in on his day off. He's sent in by the state to evict mainly Native Hawaiian uh, residents of a settlement, a fishing settlement deemed illegal by the state of Hawaii. When he gets there, things start heating up. He makes a discovery in a broken down old truck that makes him question his idea of what is legally pono or to do the right thing, versus what is culturally pono. And um, seeing all these things happen, I'm not going to give away the ending. You might be able to guess it, but you might be wrong. Um, the main point of this film, the goal, is to um, see a different perspective. You know, um, seeing these Hawaiian police officers having to go up and being put into this dilemma the situation. What are you going to do? You got a family to support. You got bills to pay. But when you're doing this, um, you know, how are you going to live with that? And so from that level down to just the everyday, the goal of this film is to have people just question, you know, what are you actually doing? What's Pono? What do you really want to do? And so um, that's where the, the goal of the project is. Um, but for this story, right now we're in pre-production. We've actually secured funding from the PIC Digital Shorts uh, Fund, and we've also received a uh, sizable income or a sizable donation from the Nichols Family Film Fund. So we have enough to do the production. What we're going to need is to, uh, one of the main things is I'd like to talk with and work with a graphic designer who has either Native Hawaiian aesthetics or indigenous aesthetics to promote and brand the film so that we can draw attention. We need to start casting. So we really need to find people who want to play these roles that we have. And another thing is because in film, the sound to me is more important than, than what the film looks like. 
we really need to work with a uh, finishing house, a sound mixing facility that can really do the film justice. Because we're going to have Olelo Hawaii, we're going to have Olelo Howling or English, we're going to have melee, we're going to have chanting. And it just needs to be powerful. And um, the last thing we need is because this is a Hawaiian film, uh, we need people to donate food, to feed the crew and feed the cast. One of the main things we're going to do is we're going to uh, be filming some scenes at Pu'uhonua Owaianai. So we'd like to really actually bring the community together and be able to feed them. You know, they, they have a lot of facilities. They have a lot of good things going on. But it'd be great to make it a community, kind of like a block party filming thing where we can actually give back to them. Um, some of the other things, basically the goal for this film is to have Hawaiians come together. And even though we're always going to have different perspectives, you know, to actually give a new perspective of what indigenous futurism looks like. Yeah, I think that's it. Great. So just um, the initial feedback, great content. I'll look forward to the reactions, but you're at seven minutes. So you're going to really have to think about what's most important okay. and how to, you know, say it a little bit more succinctly. But it seemed to me like you held the room wrapped with all of the kind of things you were saying. So just more, what do you need to say when and what can you save for the conversation afterwards? Okay. Yeah. But what are some other thoughts or reactions? Is it going to be SAG? Um, we're open to SAG. I know when you're making a film with SAG actors, there's just a lot more paperwork, but we are open to it. So we're doing SAG, but because a lot of the actors have to speak Olala Hawaii, um, you know, we'll, we'll take whoever comes. I'm expecting to work with a lot of non-actors. Uh, one of the key, um, one of the key roles is a little girl called KK, maybe about six to eight. So we're really going to target um, Hula Halau, Keiki Hula Halau, because the, um, a lot of these kids are very disciplined. They know how to perform. They know how to do things over and over again. And a lot of them can Olelo Hawaii, which is very important. Uh, we have a few people that might be our two other main <coughs> characters. But um, yeah, we're open to SAG. Any other questions, thoughts, reactions to the presentation? I really liked it. I think when you do your delivery in the very beginning, but you have to be very concise in your Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. You olelo Hawaii, you have to not so many pauses because you want to just deliver it very fluently to show that your manao or your spirit and your delivery, your knowledge is here. And so when you pause, it, it kind of feels like you're searching for the words. Okay. Yeah. So you want to you want to be very succinct in your delivery. The other thing is I noticed that as you got into your presentation, you became more and more comfortable. Because earlier, it seemed a little bit hesitant in your delivery. But then when you got into the meat of it, you became more powerful. Hmm. And every time you look over your shoulder, it makes us want to look, OK, what is he seeing there? If you're going to do delivery there, if I may, if you're going to do delivery about an image, you need to be closer to the image. And, and then when you're talking to everybody and then you're deferring, you're going to say, like the people in this picture. Okay. Because what happens is that when you when you do this, I break contact with, I lost contact with you because it makes me want to go, okay, what's happening there? If you're going to talk about there, then there has to be something impactful. When you look back, you have to say, what is it on that screen that is compelling for me to know about? Got it. Thank you. Hmm. How long enough, Bill? Uh, right now, the screenplay is 14 pages. And I want to keep it under 15. Under 15 minutes. Yeah. It happens all in one day. It's just a boom, wake up, meet the character, Willie Boy. He goes in, has to do the sweep. And then that's when the inciting incident occurs and things escalate pretty quickly. What else? Barbara. I really enjoyed it. I think it's such a global issue as well. This is what's happening in indigenous lands everywhere. Um, the people are used against each other. And um, is there any place where you kind of look at the bigger structure where the audience can have a sense of it's not just what it appears to be with one against the other, but what, what are the mechanisms behind this without preaching or? Mm, I think 
in earlier versions, because it's it's been through a lot of versions, um, it was too on the nose as far as it was, you know, it was too preachy and it was saying too much. There's one part in there that we have a demonstrator on TV, like the news, where he's pretty much telling, you know, okay, this is what's happening. But to go into the fact of, you know, how, you know, the state has, has run and part of this uh, colonialization is to bring in the people who you've colonized to be part of the enforcement. It's not really something that I want to say this is what's happening. It's just a matter of after, hopefully after multiple viewings, people will see, oh, okay, well, I didn't see that the first time. But to actually come out and say that, you know, um, I guess answering your question is kind of hard. I don't want to make it too explicit. I want it to be kind of. I just watched something called Our Boys. I don't know if anyone else has seen it about the Palestinian mm -hmm. uh, Jewish issue. And God, it's really well done. But you really see, since you're having access and it's more of a narrative, you just see the plane. You don't have to. It's so complex. But you still see where the corruption is. You have enough of the characters that are also making decisions that are above the people that are victimized and, you know, anyway. After this, I definitely want to talk to you and I'll, I'll get the name of that because I definitely want to watch things and see what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the fine line with this, with this screenplay is that it can't be too preachy. I did really want to make it about Hawaiians with Hawaiians or versus Hawaiians. Because you know, I think that's really important. We don't get to we don't get to see that much, and we see a lot of what's happening now with the protesters and protesters. But you know, when we were actually starting to write this, the Mauna Kea was you know kicking up into full steam again in 2014, and we actually saw the you know the honey between the the DLNR and one mm -hmm. of the Kupuna up there. Mm. So it seems you know it's it's. It's at the right time, it's relevant. Uh, we've secured funds because I think it is a quality project. We've put a lot of time and effort into it. And now it's the time to you know, get it done. Because that's what we need. Right. Yeah. Great. Um, in your regards to working with Uhono Alawainai, are you in collaboration with, uh, with anti symbols in them? Um, yeah, we actually went down to go and talk with um, Auntie Twinkle, and I gave her the script, and I said, you know, look it over. She, after she read it, she was like, yeah, I'm totally down. Yeah, there's, hmm. um, there's like Facebook um, communities that are... Mahalo. I will be talking to you, too. <laughs> this is a, you come uh, to good pitch. Yeah, this is a really <laughs> good example of what's speaking. So, so one thing I want to mention, specifically in, say, the good pitch context, you're really great at articulating um, the, you know, the sense of the issue and your approach to the storytelling, incredibly strong. I think what is a little bit lacking for you know, the amazing audience that we're gonna have in the room that day is, in addition to making this, what's the, what do you wanna do with it to make sure that it can have the uh, impact and effects that you really want it to have, you know, based on people seeing it or going out to forums like you're talking about to kind of bring people together to really deal with these things and what might you need from people in the room to help you do those things once you have it made. That's something I really think you should incorporate strongly into the pitch. Yeah, yeah.